So why are we here? Um, you know, the right and the left don't agree on much uh, in uh, American politics these days, or so it seems. But here's one thing, it does seem that they do agree on, at least to some extent. And that is that the United States is going through some difficult histor a difficult historical period. Uh, the middle class, uh, as we knew it at one point, no longer feels empowered and entitled, much less duty-bound, to speak out and try to affect change in the way it once did. So how do we get into this fix? How, in the span of a generation or two that are flawed but still confident and generally optimistic in advancing middle-class country, become transformed into the divided, cynical, and much more pessimistic one that we are now experiencing? Uh, fortunately for us, Hedrick Smith thinks he knows some of the answers and knows what happened. The Pulitzer Prize winning, Emmy Award winning uh, journalist, author, has written a new and extremely powerful new book entitled Who Stole the American Dream? I hope you'll pick one up after the after the program and have him sign it for you. Uh, in it, he makes a very compelling case that it has been a sequence of political and economic decisions that got us to the position and the challenging position that we are in today. Um, and I, he'll, that will be the main subject of his talk today, and I hope you'll pay attention, because I've gotten to hear this a few times now over the last couple of days as I've accompanied him around our community, and I haven't gotten tired of it yet. I feel I'm, I'm, it really resonates. I think it will resonate with you as well. I don't have to tell you that Mr. Smith is an enormously important American uh, who has really chronicled our national story uh, for over half a century at the New York Times, at uh, public broadcasting, at home and abroad, where he's been a bureau chief from you know, uh, Eastern Europe and Moscow to uh, uh, Capitol Hill. Uh, many knew him as I first, I think, became aware of him when I was in law school, when he was a regular on Washington Week in Review every Friday night. He was regaling us with some fascinating stories, fun stories about the crew that he was on Washington Week in Review with uh, during that long stint. He, he uh, headlined that program uh, in the later part of the 20th century. And uh, today, he remains an incredibly important contributor to our national debate. Um, and as just on a personal note, it's been a real honor to uh, hang out with him for this last uh, 24 hours. I picked him up at the airport yesterday. We done some media appearances on the state of things. It's actually running right now uh, this hour on WUNC radio, but that'll be rebroadcast tonight if you'd like to listen to that. He'll also be appearing at Fly League Books in Chapel Hill tonight. We had an appearance at NC State last night. I met with a group of a small group of students at NC State this morning. It's been it's just been a, a delight and an honor to accompany him. So um, I know you will enjoy hearing his message as much as I've enjoyed hearing it multiple times over the last 24 hours. So if you'll join me in welcoming Hedrick Smith. Thank you, Rob, and thank you all for being here. Uh, we just had a, a really interesting session with some students at uh, NC State this morning, just a few minutes ago, and I'm glad to meet with a continuing education class here this morning. Rob <laughs> um, mentioned Washington Week in Review. I'm going to digress from what I was going to say. Uh, are there any people who saw Washington Week in Review back in the days when Paul Duke? All right. So you you may enjoy a a, a story about Charlie McDowell and this program. Washington Week in Review, uh, if you know, has got four reporters usually and then a host, uh, and Paul Duke was the host for a very long time. And a number of us appeared fairly regularly back in the old days, Jack Nelson with the, with the Los Angeles Times, Haynes Johnson with the uh, Washington Post, myself, and Charlie McDowell of the Richmond Times and Spanish. Now Charlie was a down-home kind of Richmond, so Southern kind of guy. And, and we, you know, I covered foreign affairs and foreign policy, and Al Hunt, uh, I forgot his name, he covered the Congress, and Charlie Cordray covered the Pentagon, and Haynes Johnson would cover politics and so on. And so McDowell would often do a feature story, and that meant he, he sat in what we called the number four slot, and he'd go around the table, and each one of us in turn would lead the discussion. And uh, the others would ask questions to elicit the discussion. So that meant that Charlie McDowell, sitting in the number four slot, would ask questions for a long time before he got to talk. So he got this letter from an elderly couple, senior couple, in New York State, and it was just three sentences long. 
And the first sentence says, sometimes you don't seem to understand what the others are talking about. <laughs> and the second sentence said, neither do we. And the third sentence said, so it's a comfort to have you there. <laughs> but that's the kind of, that's the kind of, and as long as I'm in this light vein, let me just tell you that I'm going to talk about how America got into the fix it's in today. How we moved from an era of, that some of you all personally experienced uh, in, in, in your lives 30 years ago, uh, an era of great middle class prosperity, sharing of, uh, of the nation's economic growth, uh, political power of the middle class through a variety of popular movements, bipartisan politics uh, where uh, Lyndon Johnson would pass legislation and Richard Nixon would come into office from the opposite party and he'd move on. He would, his first agenda was not to repeal you know, what the last bunch did and we actually move forward in our politics a bit. How do we move from that to kind of polarized politics, starkly unequal democracy, gaping inequalities in, in our economic system and a middle class that's stuck in the rut and struggling? And thinking about sort of how to describe the situation today in a, in a light and humorous vein, I'm reminded of that cartoon uh, in Peanuts. It's the cartoon where Lucy has got a table set up, a car table set up in the backyard, and it says psychiatry one cent. And you know who walks up to the table, Charlie Brown, of course. And he puts down his pen and says, all right, Lucy, I'd like some analysis and some advice. And Lucy says to him, Charlie, uh, before I give you advice, I need to have you think of life as a voyage on a great ocean liner. Now, are you one of those people that takes your deck chair to the bow and looks to the future to see where you're going? Or are you one of those people that takes your deck chair to the stern and looks back to see where you've come from? Charlie thinks a minute and he scratches his head. He said, Lucy, I'm having trouble getting my chair unfolded. <laughs> Uh, that's one way of looking at where we are in America today. Um, I have a couple of other uh, people comment on where, where we are in America today. It's interesting, they, they didn't write about it today, they wrote about it some time ago. Uh, in the beginning of my book, Who Stole the American Dream, I've got a very interesting uh, quote from John Gardner, who was the Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare under Lyndon Johnson, and then the first leader of Common Cause, the public advocacy group. And I want to say, in connection with public advocacy, I am very impressed with what the Law Center, the North Carolina Law Center and North Carolina Policy Watch are doing. I've had a chance going around with Rob. He's not only been listening to me as we've been riding around in the car, I've been listening to him and I've been meeting his colleagues. And I think what they're doing is really wonderful. I want to give them a pat on the back for what they're doing, not just for having me here, but for what they do day in and day out, week in and week out, month in and month out. John Gardner was of that spirit, and they're of that spirit as well. John Gardner, about a decade ago, said this, we are treading the edge of oppressiveness here. Civilizations die of disenchantment. If enough people doubt their society, the whole venture falls apart. We must never let anger, fashionable cynicism, or political partisanship blur our vision on that point. We must not despair of the republic. How eloquent, how elegant, and how timely and relevant that is to us today. And then reaching back even further, Louis Brandeis said before he was appointed to the Supreme Court by Woodrow Wilson a century ago, we must make our choice. We may have democracy, or we may have wealth concentrated in the hands of a few, but we can't have both. Well worth pondering a century later. You know, we're at a time, I think, when we have more questions than answers. Yes, we've got to vote. We're not quite sure whether or not we trust any of the politicians that are in front of us. But even after the vote is done, we're not confident that they know how to, either one of them, or even the people going to Congress, really know how to lead us out of the quagmire that we're in today in America. We're not quite sure how we got there. And that's literally how I began the work on the book that I've just written, Who Stole the American Dream, three years ago. 2009, you know, it, it probably the depths uh, of the recession. Everybody knew the middle class was in trouble, the country was in trouble. 600,000 jobs a month were being eliminated. We've forgotten how bad that was. We were headed for potentially the worst disaster. We had the worst disaster since the Great Depression. Nobody was sure at that moment whether or not we might go over the cliff and even have the, the worst depression again. People were being foreclosed out of their homes. People didn't know if they could save enough money to get through the recession or pay for their kids' education or, or meet their, their own bills, particularly their medical bills. So 
So I was interested, having lived through the earlier period of middle class prosperity and power in the, in the 60s and 70s and the 1950s, how did we move from that era to the present era? What got us here? And I'm a journalist. I lived through that period. I ran the Washington Bureau of the New York Times in, in the late 70s, and I was the chief Washington correspondent in the early 80s uh, for a decade or so. I wrote a book called The Power Game about how Washington works. And I thought I understood a lot of it, but when I began to do the research for this book, I came after one surprise after another. I found out things that I thought I knew or should have known or actually looked different when I looked back at them. Uh, with the advantage of hindsight and the chance to take some time to really put the pieces together. And it's putting the pieces together that I found fascinating. I presume you, like me, uh, many of you have had a chance to read a book or two about Abraham Lincoln. I'd read a couple. I'd read good history in my American uh, courses, at, 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 uh, history courses at, at Williams College and, and high school. And I'd read some books on my own. And I began to wonder when I picked up Doris Kearns' great book, A Team of Rivals, what I was going to pick up from this that was different from what I'd seen before. And why she thought she could teach us more about Lincoln, or learn more about Lincoln, by looking at the rivals that moved along with him and taking <coughs> them through the 1820s, 1830s, 1840s, 1850s, before we got to the 60s. We all want to get to the 1860s. It's the Civil War. It's the testing of the nation. And yet, as I read the book aloud with my wife, Susan, I came to understand that getting that whole broad picture and moving through the history, and even though there were a lot of details that I knew before, they fit into a pattern, fit into a picture, made more sense to me. The whole cloth, the, the woven texture of the history of that time was so much more clear and understandable the way she told the story. And so I've tried to do something like that in going back and checking the roots of where we came from in America today by going through the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. Not just because I thought the decades were interesting, but because when I started to grasp the threads of history, they pulled me back to that earlier period. And I found that some of the most profound changes that occurred that affect us literally today started back there in that period of the 1970s. And I got all kinds of surprises along the way. I didn't know, for example, that the main victims of subprime loans in the housing crisis were people who actually deserved prime loans. They were prime borrowers who got talked into, cajoled into, persuaded into, bamboozled into, cheated into loans that cost them a lot more in terms of fees and interest rates than they ever should have been paying. Made great profits for the mortgage brokers and the banks, but lots of those people suffered, and, and 15 million of them are still stuck in those loans, paying mortgages on, on houses that are worth less than the market value of the house through no fault of their own because the housing market collapsed. I didn't know that homeowners lost $6 trillion of wealth, the greatest transfer of wealth in the history of this country during the housing boom before it hit bottom because they were sucking so much equity out of their home mortgages in the false belief that housing prices were going to keep going up forever and they could borrow to pay for their kids' education, their medical costs, and a lot of them for the just plain old ordinary costs of living. Six trillion dollars. At the beginning, in the late 1980s, Americans owned 70% of the value of their homes. <coughs> By 2009, they owned 40% of the value of their homes. Initially, the banks owned 30%. At the end, the banks owned 60%. 30% of $20 trillion moved from homeowners to banks and to big investors on Wall Street. As I said, the biggest shift of wealth in the history of our country. And it occurred while we thought we were doing well, even before the housing boom busted. I didn't realize the 401k program was never intended to be a national retirement program is actually put into the law as a favor to a couple of corporations, Xerox and Kodak, for their executives, and then how it evolved. I had remembered that the tax rate really doesn't have much to do with the national growth rate, despite the debate that you hear in the last couple of presidential debates. Some of our best growth years as a nation, three or four percent a year, 
came under Dwight Eisenhower, Republican president in the 1950s, when the maximum tax rate was 92%. Or under John F. Kennedy, Democrat, in the 1960s, when the maximum tax rate was 77%. And the absolute worst growth rates we've had in the last seven decades occurred under George W. Bush, Republican, and Barack Obama, Democrat, when the maximum tax rate was 35%. So by going back and looking at the track record, I began to get a different picture of our current predicament and how we got here. And let me take a moment with that era of Eisenhower and Kennedy when our growth rate was so great. Not only was the growth rate great, but what was really important was the benefits of that growth rate were being shared widely among the public. Remember, that was an era when Richard Nixon, as the vice president under Dwight Eisenhower in 1959, went to Moscow where the American exhibition had the famous thing that you may recall was called the kitchen debate because it was in the kitchen exhibition where America was showing off to the Russians what great kitchen appliances we had and what the American middle class standard of living was about. And I see some heads nodding in response to that. And Khrushchev shows up in the kitchen exhibition the leader of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union and the Prime Minister, and he says to Nixon, we're going to build a classless society in the Soviet Union. And Nixon sticks his finger right in Khrushchev's eye and says, we already have a classless society in America. Now, we know, Nixon knew, that was an exaggeration, but it pointed to something very important, that the wealth and prosperity and growth and productivity of the American economy were widely shared. In analytical terms, economists call that the period of the great convergence. And what they mean is that the salaries and incomes at the top, the CEOs, were not that far from the average worker's pay, the people in the middle, which was not that far from the people at the bottom who were, who were poor. Yes, there was poverty. Of course there was. There were booms and busts. There were business cycles in our economy. Everything wasn't hunky-dory. <clears throat> but the differences among people, the sharing of prosperity and the sharing of the pain of a downturn was widespread. What had happened was since World War II, the productivity of the American workforce had grown almost doubled. It had grown 97% from 1945 to 1973. And the pay and the salaries and therefore the living standards of average Americans, not just factory workers, but small business people, people who worked in grocery stores, pharmacies, plumbers, electricians, uh, gas stations, their average hourly pay and compensation went up 95%. 97% growth in productivity, 95% growth in people's standards of living. And that happened for a number of reasons, but one reason it happened is that the business leaders of that era believed it was their responsibility to support and sustain and, and, and nurture the economic well-being of all the stakeholders in their corporation. That word stakeholders is very important. We're talking about stakeholder capitalism. By the way, there's stakeholder capitalism today in Germany and in continental Europe, and there's stakeholder capitalism in Asia, in Japan, and in the and in the countries, I'm not talking about communist China, but the other countries of Asia, that's fairly common. And what do they mean by stakeholder capitalism? They mean the, the, the groups that had a, a stake in the success of the corporation. Of course the owners, the shareholders, but the managers, the workers, the suppliers, the creditors, the customers, the communities in which those corporations operate, a whole group, at least half a dozen groups of people and you, it isn't just me who says that. Go back and look at the quotes. You can read Charlie Wilson, uh, CEO of General Motors, Reg Jones, CEO of General Electric, uh, Frank Abrams, CEO of Standard Oil in New Jersey, forerunner of ExxonMobil. This is literally what they said, and this is what was taught in business schools. It was thought that it was against good business ethics to take stock options for the people at the top of American corporations who obviously had special inside information on whether or not the corporation was going to build a new plant, come out with a new product, or was in trouble. For them to cash in on that ahead of regular investors was unfair. That was the ethic at the time. Think how different that is today from shareholder capitalism, which is focused not so much on even the shareholders. It's really focused on rewarding the managers who get the biggest chunk of shares going. <clears throat> 
a very different, more selfish kind of capitalism than stakeholder capitalism. And it hasn't always been that way, and it doesn't always have to be that way. There's a tendency in any age to assume that wherever you are and whatever you're doing is what you have to be doing. It never was any way different, and that's simply not true. So we had that stakeholder capitalism, and it was supported by middle class political power. What we often forget, and we tend to divide economics from politics except we're in the middle of a campaign. But when we analyze our history and we write about it, we tend to separate economics and politics, but they really go together. That middle class prosperity, that shared prosperity that, that, would, that so supported the nation and helped develop the economy continuously over a long period of time, was buttressed by middle class political power. You had very strong movements. Back in the 1970s, the environmental movement, 20 million Americans. 20 million Americans were involved in protests, <clears throat> marches, talkathons, meetings in parks, meetings in schools and universities in places like this, because they were outraged at the pollution of America's air and water. And they were demanding, they were angry and they were demanding change. And within a year, Congress passed nine major pieces of environmental legislation. Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, Anti-Toxic Substances Act, Clean Drinking Water Act, a whole slew of them. Richard Nixon, Republican president, admirer of CEOs who loved, loved to, to cavort with them at B.B. Rebozo's place down in the Key Biscayne in Florida. No tree-hugging environmentalist was he, and yet he created the Environmental Protection Agency and the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, a whole lot of other things, in response to public pressure. Consumer movement, pressure to make products honestly labeled, to not market defective products. Ralph Nader had written that book, Unsafe at Any Speed, accusing General Motors and Ford and Chrysler and the other American automakers of marketing defective cars that were causing accidents and actually killing people. So the pressure was on business to jack up its standards, to ensure quality, to be honest in labeling. Very important. And all kinds of legislation of that kind was passed, too. Uh, and the women's movement protesting that men were making 100 cents on the dollar and women were making 41 cents. They didn't get all the way, but they got up to about 79 cents on the dollar. Very important changes with legislative support from Congress. And it goes on and on. Civil rights movement, tremendous impact. Peace movement, tremendous impact on policy. People believed in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s that they had power and that people power could move political power in Washington come back to this point, it's very important. That was very important. And so was the power of trade unions. I know labor unions aren't terribly popular in the South, but labor unions actually were a key support for the underpinnings of a middle class standard of living in America. You can go back to a thing that historians call the Treaty of Detroit. It was the agreement between General Motors and the United Auto Workers Union. What it did was it gave General Motors, Charlie Wilson, the CEO of General Motors, was tired of wildcat strikes. He said, I want to get back to making cars and selling cars and making money and making this corporation successful. There have been a lot of wildcat strikes, so there are a lot of labor disputes. And Walter Ruther said, the head of the United Auto Workers Union said, yeah, all right, we'll agree to that. But we want steady jobs. We want rising pay over the five-year life of this contract, three or four percent a year, keep up with inflation. We want to, we want to move ahead. We want health benefits, and we want retirement benefits. And Wilson said, you got a deal. And that became the model for the auto industry, Ford and Chrysler, for the steel industry, US Steel, Bethlehem Steel, for the rubber industry, the electronic industry, the atomic energy industry. It became the model for many, many non-union companies. In fact, the Treaty of Detroit uh, probably influenced the standard of living and the pay and the lifestyle of many more non-union people that it affect than the union people it affected. At that point, about 27, 28 percent, maybe 30 percent of the, the workers in the private sector were in unions. 70 percent were not. But they all benefited from the Treaty of Detroit because that became the standard by which you measured a good company. And it coincided with this idea of stakeholder capitalism. So things worked together. So you had that power and you had that shared prosperity. And that characterized the era of the heyday of the middle class. And then it begins to come apart. It starts to come apart in the 1970s. And what's interesting to me, I should have known this, but I didn't, I'd never heard of it. 
guy named Lewis Powell, whose name may be familiar to you. He was a Supreme Court Justice appointed to the High Court by Richard Nixon at the end of 1971. Served for 15 or 16 years. Was on the conservative side of the court, but not a radical conservative. Um, very modest man, spoke with a Tidewater drawl. Uh, used to walk around uh, Linda Greenhouse, the Supreme Court reporter for the New York Times, Washington Bureau, said that, that Powell would sometimes walk around the court uh, in soft shoes or slippers and his shirt sleeves. And when people from Montana or Michigan or, or Maryland or someplace else would come to the Capitol and visit the, the main sites of the Capitol, they came to the Supreme Court building, they would mistake uh, Lewis Powell for a custodian. They'd ask him the way to the men's room or the ladies' room. Um, but Powell was no soft-spoken uh, custodian. Uh, Powell was a vigorous corporate attorney. And he, by the end of 1971, or middle of 1971, he was absolutely convinced that the free enterprise system was in mortal danger from the very powers that I was just talking about, from the environmental movement, uh, from the labor movement, from the consumer movement, and from the regulatory agencies that were being spawned. Now, he never said by whom, but actually by Richard Nixon. The EPA, OSHA, the Mine Safety Administration, Traffic Safety Administration, all those things came under, actually came into being under Nixon rather than even under Democrat Lyndon Johnson who preceded it. So he was protesting Nixon's policies. Um, but he said, business, business leaders, you're the forgotten man in Washington. You've got to get organized. You've got to come to Washington. At the time he wrote, there were only 170 companies that even had offices in Washington uh, to, uh, to try to lobby the Congress or lobby the administration. He said, you've got to get into the political arena. You've got to fight Ralph Nader. You've got to fight the trade union movement. You've got to identify your foes. You've got to fight them aggressively. You've got to organize and come together because then often businesses would lobby against each other because they didn't always agree. What was beneficial to one business was often harmful to another business. So they were often fighting among themselves. He said, you've got to cut that out. You've got to organize. You've got to get together. You've got to pool your money. This is what, 40 years before super PACs, he's saying you've got to pool your money and use it politically and take the high ground in Washington. But what's astonishing is that is exactly what happened. Within four months of Powell's memo, which he actually had written at the request of some friends of his at the US Chamber of Commerce, the Chamber of Commerce had distributed it uh, to many business leaders around the country. And within four months, the 150, 160 largest corporations in America formed the Business Roundtable. I don't know if you've heard of it, but you should have. It's the single most powerful voice of business of corporate America in Washington today. It has enormous political clout. It gets CEOs when there's a big battle over any important economic or tax legislation in Washington. The CEOs of the biggest corporations fly in. They talk to the secretary of this, that, and the other thing. They talk to the chairman of the committees. They talk to the house speaker. They talk to everyone. They use their political muscle. And before that, they never did that. So that's one thing that happened. Second thing that happened, instead of there being 175 companies with offices in Washington, eight years later, there were 2,425. There were 50,000 people working for business trade associations by 1980. There were 9,000 registered corporate lobbyists. There were 8,000 uh, corporate PR people. The number of corporate lobbyists by 1980 outnumbered the members of Congress, both houses, 130 to 1. So there were plenty of people to go lobby Congress. This is what I call Powell's Army. Now you can say, well, that's interesting, Rick, but why does it matter? It's interesting, it matters, and you can see exactly when it starts to matter. I used to think that it all changed when Ronald Reagan was elected to the White House in 1980 and came to power in 1981. But when I went back and did my history and put it together, the pivotal Congress, the watershed Congress, in American history over the last 50 years was the Congress of 1978 when the Democrats controlled both houses of Congress and when Jimmy Carter was president. Now why do I say that? What happened was after Richard Nixon left office and Jerry Ford took office, there had been Republican presidents in office uh, for two terms. And so in 1976, after the election of Carter, uh, the labor movement and the consumer movement thought, well, this is going to be the time when we're going to get past the bills we've been waiting for for a long time, bills that would make it easier for labor to organize, bills that would set up the Consumer Protection Agency and so forth. So they pushed hard for those bills in this Congress I'm talking about. And Ralph Nader's Consumer Protection Bureau bill died in the House, strangled, suppressed, beaten back by Powell's army. 
the labor bills got through the House, but they died in the Senate. Once again, the business lobbyists snuffed them out. But business wasn't satisfied with that. By the time they won those victories, business said, well, we can get a lot more. And they got the 401k program. It got put into the tax code by Barbara Conable, an upstate New York Republican, who was doing a favor for Kodak and Xerox, the two big companies that had home offices in his district, and they wanted to give a new retirement benefit, profit-sharing benefit to their top executives. And so they went to Conable and said, if we do this, can you write a, a tax shelter into the tax code for them so they can get the retirement, they don't have to pay taxes on it, it can grow until they retire. And then when they draw the money out, they'll pay the tax, they'll pay taxes on it. You recognize that because that's the way the 401k program operates. But it was done for them. It was never done as a national retirement program. It didn't become a national retirement program until the Reagan administration said, okay, we'll let it be for every worker. And then it really took another decade until the 1980s when the mutual fund industry wanted to get its hands on managing all the money that was in the retirement programs of many of these companies. And they said, wow, if we can get our hands on that money, there's big money there. And they sold it to everybody. Power to the people. Do it yourself retirement. Why let your boss do it? You can do it better. It has been a disaster for the middle class. In the first case, first place, what happened was hundreds of billions of dollars of expense for businesses and corporations was taken off their books and moved into the pocketbooks and checkbooks of ordinary Americans. Businesses used to have to spend eight or nine percent of their payroll to pay for those lifetime pension plans that six out of seven American workers got back in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, up until 1980. When they went to the 401k program, it only cost them two or three percent of their payroll. So they save about five or six percent of their payroll. If you take American corporations, that's hundreds of billions of dollars a year. And that money now has to be spent by the middle class. But the second thing is, not only did all that expense get shifted over, but it turned out that most middle class people, and I don't think there's probably anybody in this room who would have this kind of problem, but, but, uh, but the average 401k balance today is $18,000. The average median, excuse me, not average, median 401k balance for people who've been in the program for 20 years who are in their 60s and they're about to retire is $85,000. Now that is a small fraction of what financial experts say you need. What you need is roughly 10 to 12 times your final pay. So if your final pay is $50,000, 10 times is $500,000 or $600,000. $85,000 isn't going to get you there. Average lifespan, if you retire at 65, is 17 years. That means you live to, to 82. $17,000 happens, and 17 years happens neatly to go into $85,000 five times. That's $5,000 a year on top of Social Security. For a whole lot of American families, that is going to mean a dramatic drop in living standards. The experts that I talk to say that 45% of the baby boomer generation will not be able to cover their basic financial costs based on Social Security and whatever they have in their 401k plans. 45% will not be able to cover their basic financial costs. It's not the same living standard they had before they retired. To me, that says poverty. That's a huge proportion. In the next 10 years, we're really going to see this as a major national problem. That got started in the 1978 Congress. Next thing that got started in the 1978 Congress was a change in the corporate bankruptcy law. You're going to say, why, Rick, in a bunch of like this, are you going to bother us with a corporate bankruptcy law? Because it had enormous impact. Under the old law, when a corporation went bankrupt, it was turned over to the management of a bankruptcy referee or a bankruptcy trustee. Why? Because when a company goes bankrupt, everybody's going to take a hit. Everybody, in the language of business, everybody's going to take a haircut. It's a lot of pain. Creditors are going to lose money. Shareholders are going to get wiped out. Employees, managers are all going to take a hit. So turn it over to a neutral person who will parcel out the pain in somewhat equal fashion, somewhat fair fashion. They change the law so that the management of the existing management of the corporation would remain in control of the corporation during bankruptcy, not a bankruptcy referee. Why is that important? Because the management is going to take care of itself. And if you look at the, the bankruptcies that happened, a slew of them, Eastern Airlines, uh, United Airlines, Delta Airlines, now American Airlines, steel companies, Wharton Steel, Bethlehem Steel, LTV Steel, I can't even remember them all, so many of them. 
And in every single one of those, yes, the shareholders got hurt. The stock went down to nothing or one or two bucks. But the main people who took the loss were the middle class employees, whether they were back office or front office. Uh, they, at United Airlines, they lost $4 billion in benefits, health benefits, pension benefits, wages. Uh, and by the way, the attorneys and financial experts who managed the financial bankruptcy of United made $400 million in fees while the employees were losing $4 billion. And that is typical. So huge loss to employees and the middle class in that corporate bankruptcy law revision of 1978. And the third thing that business did, and this was mostly at the behest of the banks and the financial institutions, was to change the national interest laws. Most states, I think North Carolina was among them, but most states at that time had usury laws which set a limit on what you could charge on a mortgage loan, what you could charge on an auto loan, what you could charge on a student loan, what you could charge on a retail loan. And the banks didn't like that. They wanted to expand their lending, and they particularly wanted to expand their lending to people who were poor credit risk, and they said, we can't possibly make any money if the maximum interest we can charge is 7 or 8%. We want to be able to charge 15, 18, 20%, whatever it takes to make this a break-even or a profitable financial deal for us. So they got Congress to pass a federal law that wiped out all the state usury laws. That set the basis for the subprime crisis because the subprime crisis was based on marketing to poor risks and the banks charged them 10, 14, 18, 20% interest rates. Now that was supposed to be for poor risks, but if you don't pay your credit card balance in full today, have you ever noticed what interest rate you're paying? You're not paying that 7 or 8% you used to pay. You're up there paying that 20% like a bad risk. The bank simply just pocketed that. They made that gain. It's very profitable. They've kept it there. If there's some bankers in the room, I'm sorry if that's offended you, but that is exactly what has happened uh, to, to all consumers. But the most important thing was it opened the, the floodgates for the subprime uh, crisis, which occurred. Actually, it started in the 90s and then backed off, and it really exploded in the 2000s. So three big things. And then the final thing they did was they turned around the tax law. Jimmy Carter wanted to close up the loopholes in the tax law. He wanted to drop some poor income people off the, the low income people off the tax rolls, and he wanted to raise the corporate tax rate a couple of percent. When Powell's army was done with that tax bill, it came back exactly the opposite direction. There were no closing of loopholes. Uh, the corporate tax rate wasn't raised 2%, it was low, lower 2%. Not very much in numbers, but very important in political direction. And the capital gains rate, which benefits all investors, but particularly benefits wealthy investors since they have more money invested, was dropped from 48% to 28%. Single biggest drop in the capital gains tax rate uh, since it was enacted years and years and years ago. So tremendous changes there. I remember talking to my friend Arthur Levitt, who was then president of the American Stock Exchange, asking him about this uh, outcomes uh, of, of this session of Congress and what had happened. He said, what's happened is business has discovered that they can get what they want economically by exercising their power politically. We've seen what we can do with our power, and we're going to be back for more. There's no question. That was a watershed period. It was a game changer in American politics. It was a game changer in terms of power, and it was a game changer in terms of psychology, and it's affected the way political campaigns have been run and financed, and it's certainly been affected the way Congress has operated ever since it affects us today. It's like, it was like that moment that you see when, in a five-set match, when, when Nadal and, and Feder are locked in a tight match, and, and they've been playing for four hours, and it's three-all or four-all, and then suddenly one of them manages to get a service break. And you just know the match from then on has been decided, even if they have to play several more games. Or, or one of your basketball teams down here, Duke or Carolina or Wake Forest, NC State, I don't want to offend anybody else. <laughs> but you've got so many good ones down here. But you know, they're in a very tight game, and then suddenly there's a breakaway, and then one team starts to get a streak of four or five points together, and then you can just sense the momentum changing. That's what happened in American politics in 1978. Of course, much more was done under Reagan substantively. There were bigger tax cuts, there were more changes in the financial rules, but the, but the and deregulation that was begun in that same 1978 Congress, deregulation of the communications industry, uh, the airline industry, and the trucking industry, I forgot to mention them. So there was a lot of stuff done then. It accelerated under Reagan.
but the change had occurred then under the Democrats, uh, and it's been with us ever since. Now, what's interesting is that at the same time that was going on in the political arena, there was a very important change taking place in the economy. Very fundamental change. The change was occurring in the ethos of the business leaders of the country. And we began to see the effects of it in what I call wedge economics. And by wedge economics, I, I, I mean this. I mean that there was a wedge driven horizontally into the American economy. So that the people below the wedge, and those are people in the middle, the people below the wedge did not continue to share in the profits and the growth and the productivity of the American economy. And the people above the wedge took all the gains. Matter of fact, in 2010, the top 1% recovering from this, this recession, the top 1% of income earners in the country took 93% of the nation's economic gains. That's how lopsided it was just recently. But if you go back to the 1970s, remember I told you productivity from 45 to 75 or 73 roughly doubled and so did the standard of living. From 1973 to 2011, the productivity of the American workforce rose 80%. And the total hourly compensation of the average wage earner, salary earner in America, rose 10%. 80% growth in productivity, 10% growth in pay. They got cut out of their share. The Census Bureau told us last year that if you took a typical male worker, it's very important because if you look at household income, household income has been going up, but it's been going up because more women are working and they're working longer hours. And so the input of labor is higher. So you want to get the, what's the reward for the same input of labor? The average male worker in 2011 made the same hourly pay as in 1978 adjusted for inflation. In fact, in 2011, it was just a tiny, tiny fraction lower. That's three decades of going nowhere. At the same time, the median pay of a major corporate CEO went up 350%. And the income of the people at the top 1% went up 600%. So you got 600% here, 350% here, and zero here. That is wedge economics at work. Now, that's bad for the middle class. We know that. That's tough on people. They don't have enough money. They can't afford what they need to pay for. It is also bad economics. It is not smart economics. There are now ample studies, both of American history and by the International Monetary Fund of other countries as well, that say absolutely it slows the growth of a country to have high disparity of income. But the best growth occurs when there is this, what I called before, the great compression of income. One of the reasons why the growth was so good under Eisenhower and Kennedy is because we had that compression of income. And one of the basic reasons why we have such slow growth now is we have such enormous disparity of income. Now, it isn't just me, it isn't just liberal economists, it isn't just Keynesians who say we have high disparity of income. If you look at the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, the 34 most advanced economies in the world, the United States is third in terms of the greatest disparity of income among those 34 countries. The only two countries that are worse are Chile and Mexico. So if you were worried about America becoming, the danger of America becoming a banana republic, don't worry anymore, we're there. We're already there. It isn't just the OECD that's saying it. Citigroup is saying it. Advertising Age is saying it. Citigroup put out a study, uh, a very slick investment brochure in 2005 to its most wealthy investors. And it said to them, don't bother investing in companies that produce for the middle class. Not enough purchasing power. Don't bother in producing for the companies that produce for the upper middle class. Not enough purchasing power. Only invest in the Tiffany's and the countries that are uh, the companies that are selling to the top one or two percent because that's where purchasing power in America is concentrated. That's Citigroup. Citigroup said the United States in 2005 was like Spain in the 16th century. Advertising aid said exactly the same thing to marketing managers of the biggest companies in America. Don't bother marketing to the middle class and the upper middle class. Just concentrate on the 40% of America's spending power, which is in the hands of the top 1% or 2%. Now, 
That's a disaster for us economically. It's not smart economics. It's terrible in politics. It's re it, you see it reinforced in politics. People of billionaires are putting enormous amounts of money into our campaign. Our campaigns are absolutely lopsided. Uh, you guys in North Carolina, I live in Washington, D.C., nobody cares about us. They know we're all going to go Democratic up there. And they, you know, we have very few electoral votes anyway. But you're inundated right now uh, because there's so darn much money in politics. You can barely hear an argument that's intelligent about our policies and our problems because you're getting hit by these bombarding of, of, of arguments on either side that are telling you things you already know, but they're just trying to hammer away at their points. I mean, it's distorted our politics terribly. Our political middle has largely disappeared. We've become polarized as a nation. I go through all of that. I'm not going to take time for that. But the question is, what do we do about it? I didn't really want to write about that. I said, uh, my editor said, Rick, you've told people a pretty dismal story here. You better, you better help people get out of the ditch. And I said, well, right, I'm a reporter. My job is to analyze things, go back, check the record, and tell the story. My job is not. The policy stuff, that's up to the president, that's up to the candidates, it's up to the think tanks, the policy one. She said, no, 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 you, you've got to do this. You, you can't leave people here. And I tried to resist her, but then I got advice from on high. My wife said, Rick, case right, you've got to do it. I did it. Okay, so on the back of this book are a couple of chapters of Patrick Smith's handy-dandy 10-point plan to save America. Um, I'm making fun of it because I'm embarrassed about it a little bit because as a reporter, I don't really think it's my job, but I do think it's my job as a citizen, so I put it in there. Look, it isn't difficult to figure out some of the basic things that need to be done. I, these are not my ideas. I just went around and looked at very intelligent ideas that I saw that other people had. We have a really dumb tax system. We have a tax system that is rewarding companies for moving jobs overseas. If you run the big companies, the big multinationals, and you operate overseas, you are paying a lower tax rate uh, than the people who run the hotels and restaurants and, 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 and companies and stock brokerage houses, whatever they're doing here, real estate agencies, automobile dealerships, whatever, right here. People who are manufacturing things to be consumed in America, they're paying roughly 35%. And the folks over the, who've got big operations overseas are paying all the way down to zero. You probably don't know this, but from 2008 to 2010, we had 78 major corporations Exxon Mobil, Goldman Sachs, Merck, uh, Lilly, I can't even remember them all. My favorite is General Electric. They paid zero federal corporate income taxes from 2008 to 2010. That's three years. General Motors made $10 billion in profits during those three years, and it got a $4.5 billion tax rebate from the federal government. Now, that's not a very sensible tax system. Part of it is they got credit for investing in research and development, which is about investing in the future and about growing America. So that's sensible. But a big chunk of it was because a lot of their operations are overseas, and they don't get taxed on the, that income unless they bring it back to America. And if they get ready to bring it back to America, in fact, there's an argument about this right now, there are a whole bunch of companies that say, we have a trillion dollars worth of profits overseas. We'd like to bring it back and create jobs in America. Sounds good. Sounds like a smart deal. Well, they said the same thing in 2005. They said, but we'll only do it if we get a tax holiday. What they mean by a tax holiday is a reduced tax rate. Now, the normal tax rate is 35%. The tax holiday they got in 2005 was a 5% tax rate. 35%, 5%, really good deal. But they said, we're gonna invest in jobs in America. And so George W. Bush and his administration said, that sounds like a good deal. Economists went back and they tracked that money. 90% of that money went to executive pay and dividends to stockholders. Only 10% of that money was invested in jobs in America. So number one, let's close that overseas tax loophole. Number two, we bailed out the banks to the tune of $700 billion. The banks didn't bail out the homeowners. We still got homeowners who are stuck in those low interest loans. I mean, those high interest loans, <coughs> excuse me. Now, why should we care about that? Well, we might care about it just from simple ideas of fairness. But even if fairness doesn't move you, how about smart economics? Why is it smart economics to refinance all those home loans of people who are in those high bubble area interest rate loans? Because if they have 8 and 9% interest rate loans now, they could be refinanced at current rates, which are 3.5%, 3.25%, 4%. They would save 5% or so on their loans. For millions of families, that's going to mean $1,000 a month. 
multiply that all across the country by 12 times a year, and you're talking about generating hundreds of billions of dollars of purchasing power. Now, purchasing power is what we need in America. You've heard all kinds of stuff for the last three or four years about the job creators in America. Let me give you some straight talk. This is not partisan. The job creators in America are you, middle class consumers. 70% of the American economy is driven by consumer demand. We had those prosperous years before because employers paid workers well. Tens of millions of workers went into the market. They bought goods that pushed business to increase production, which meant building new plants, hiring new workers, buying new equipment, empowering the next cycle of growth. We are not short of capital. We do not need the quote job creators unquote quote unquote at the top to get more money. The venture capitalists there was a story in the New York Times three weeks ago. The venture capitalists have accumulated a trillion dollars in investment funds, and they can't find companies to invest it in, and they're thinking of returning the money to the investors. Why? Because demand is so low, growth is so slow, <laughs> that there aren't businesses that look like good investments. Low wages means low demand means low growth. It means we're not going anywhere going to go there very, very slowly. That's the structural problem in America today. So anything that will release consumer demand will help the economy. And one way to do that is to, is to refinance all those loans. Another way is rebuild the American infrastructure. Another way is to invest more in research and development. There are a whole bunch of fairly simple ideas. And by the way, a lot of them are backed by bipartisan people. Former Democratic Governor John Rendell of, of Pennsylvania, former Republican Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger of California. There are a whole slew of things, but we barely get them surfaced. They don't even get discussed very seriously in, in the campaign debates. It's a shame. But the single most important thing is we've got to change the political dynamics of America. What I'm about to say is not what you want to hear, but you need to hear it. The political system in America is not going to change unless we push it to change, unless we go back and remember what they were doing in the 1960s and 70s. The people in Washington actually like the way this system is working. We say government isn't working. They say government is working. It's working for them the way they want it to work. Organized special wealthy interests and corporate interests are pushing the system to work they want it to work. And the lobbyists in Washington are having a field day. It is one of the great growth industries in America during this bad, bad economic time. They are going to change it. It's only going to change if we change the pronoun in the sentence. As long as we keep saying they've got to change it, it's not going to change. Because they don't want to change it. We have to say we want to change it. We have to say the same kind of things that people did in the environmental movement, in the consumer movement, in the labor movement, in the women's movement, in the peace movement of the 1960s and 70s. What's going on now is unfair. It's intolerable. And it's not smart. It's not working. And it isn't just. And I'm talking about this presidency. We could, we could be having this discussion five years ago with a different president, OK? It's not just what this president did or didn't do, or the last president did or didn't do. Obviously, their policies had an impact. But the problems we've had have accumulated over the last three or four decades. And if we're going to get back to where we want to be, to a really good society where wealth is, is shared and where, where middle class Americans have a sense of security and hope, genuine hope, and we're going to have to change fundamental things. What do you see about the feasibility of public financing of campaigns? Well, uh, that's a very good question. What do you see about the feasibility of uh, public financing of campaigns? There are states that have experimented with that. Maine is one of them, and it's worked quite well. Uh, so it's certain, I, I, there's got to be some kind of campaign finance reform. But I honestly uh, question whether or not it's going to happen without a constitutional amendment, because we continue to have a Supreme Court that makes decisions that, that basically overturn the legislation that, that Congress passed. And I mean, look at the people who are behind it. You have Russell, Russell Feingold, you know, a very liberal Democrat from Wisconsin, and John McCain, a very conservative Republican, agreeing that we got to do something. And McCain, I've quoted in my book, talks about the American democracy being up for sale for so many dollars. But we got to fix that. And, and people are upset about Citizens United, very understandably, because it's cut loose the super PACs in, in a very big way. Uh, my hunch is that may be one of the issues around which people will begin to, to start to form an, another movement. Um, I think, uh, frankly, I think it's a good idea, but I think it's going to have to be embraced in a, probably a larger, a larger reform.
this over there. What can we do about Grover Norquist? <laughs> Ooh, we'll put him in a bathtub. You know what? You know what? You know what, you know what no, you know what Grover Norquist says. Grover Norquist is the leader of uh, Americans for Tax Justice or something like that. I forget what he's called. And he's he is probably the single most powerful lobbyist in Washington today, at least on the issue of taxes. And he's against. And he's got he's got members of Congress and members of legislatures all across the country, they've signed that they will, will never vote for any tax increase at all. And so he was interviewed uh, on the radio, and the interviewer said, well, do you want to destroy government? He said, no, no, I just want to shrink government uh, down to a size where I can put it in a bathtub and drown it. That's what I call bathtub conservatism. Um, so you know, what we can do with Grover Norquist is get him small enough where we can put him in a bathtub. No, I think what we can do is we can back politicians who say, I mean, we have the Erskine Bowles report, which was a bipartisan report, and, 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 and it bears the name of a blessed North Carolinian, uh, you know, Erskine Bowles, who's a good man. Um, this was a serious bipartisan effort to try to for, forge an agreement on a very difficult issue, which is how do we bring our spending and our, and our government budgets under control and, and share the pain, kind of like a bankruptcy referee. And the idea was you've got to increase taxes and you've got to uh, cut spending. And, and there are a whole variety of formulas included there. I think we have got to come together. We, we have got to recognize that we have a system of government set up deliberately by the founders to divide power. And that requires compromise. You simply cannot have a functioning American government when you have any people, left or right, who say, I will never compromise. And so I think that's what you can do with no requirements. We, we have to reject that as a way of operating. Yes, we can argue about which taxes we should have. Yes, we can argue about what's fair. But we can't argue about whether or not we need the revenues, by the way. The American tax revenues are now at their lowest level in 60 years. Among the OECD states, we have the third lowest tax rate. So we're not exactly a highly taxed nation either in terms of our own history or in terms of other nations that we compete with. And the argument is we couldn't possibly compete with other countries because it would hurt us. Um, and the historical record, as I've indicated, shows that we've had very good growth with high tax rates and, and we've had very bad growth with low tax rates. Now, I don't mean low tax rates mean low growth, but there's just not a connection. So there are a bunch of phony arguments that have been put out in front of us. We need to recognize them and then act on that knowledge. There was a question up here. Or here. Oh, you got one right there. Excellent. My colleagues and friends are evenly split when we talk about the political system between things have never, ever been worse, and this is cyclical and it will change again. And I'd love your perspective on it. Uh, well, um, yeah, I think if you look back at our history, probably the Civil War was the time when things were the worst. <laughs> The country did blow apart, so uh, I don't think we're in that bad a shape. But certainly in terms of the last 50 or 60 years, the political divisiveness in America and the lack of political civility, the, the inability to carry on an intelligent, common sense discussion with disagreement is, is really vastly disappeared. One of the tests of that um, was very interesting. Max Baucus, who's a Democrat, but a very conservative Democrat, from Montana remarked that he used to see his colleagues at the Senate dining room, and he would lunch with other senators of both parties. He said the Senate dining room is now deserted. They don't even eat lunch together. Uh, you, you have congressional junkets uh, where the Agricultural Committee will go out to the farm states and look at uh, the impact of farm legislation, or the foreign policy committees will go overseas and look at the impact of, of the foreign policy and so forth. And they've historically all been done in a bipartisan way. In the last Congress, the first time I've seen it, they now go in two separate trips. That's a time when people can get together and begin to masticate, to chew on the difficult problems and work out solutions together. So I would say we're in very bad shape. And we need to pay some attention. But you can pay attention. And you can do something about it. Uh, one of the problems in American politics today, and I've got a couple of chapters dealing with this, is the disappearance of the political middle in our political system. It's very important for the question I was talking about before and yours, which is political compromise. Um, we now have a political uh, apportionment system, which is now run by the politicians, which is gerrymandering congressional and legislative districts so that they're safe Democratic and safe Republican seats. So you put either party in power and they're working around to their advantage and concede 
impossible districts and then shape them in, in ridiculous uh, forms in order to avoid competitive districts. Actually, we'd be better off having competitive districts and politicians would have to appeal to the middle. So I think one of the things we need to do is to take the business of, 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 of apportioning, redistricting, or gerrymandering out of the hands of the politicians and put it in the hands of the courts. That's one thing that's to be done. Second thing that can be done in practical terms is to open primaries. There are now some states, Washington State is the leader among, that run single primaries. What we have is a primary system in which, in which few voters vote, but the people who vote are the people who are most passionately ideological in each party, so that you have candidates who appeal to the political extremes uh, without commenting on the substance of Mr. Romney's positions. If you look at how Mr. Romney ran in the primary to get himself nominated, and then now he's where he's trying to position himself in the general election, that's a pattern that goes way beyond Mitt Romney. There's a pattern of American elections. It's insane that our nominating system requires people probably to move away from their positions and then try to scramble back to their positions in the general election. So if we open primaries, and let people from both parties vote in the same primary, and independents, and moderates, and unaffiliated, the pressure would be on politicians to appeal to the middle instead of to the extremes. So both by changing redistricting and by changing the primary system, we would reduce the highly polarizing influence of political parties. And by the way, we all remember George Washington's farewell address. And he said, avoid entangling alliances, right? He also said, avoid political parties. They will ruin the system. People have forgotten that. So that's, that's, that's relevant today. Well. Uh, I, your comment about people power and sort of counterbalancing money power appeals to me in the abstract. But I yeah. guess I want to challenge you for just a second. Good. Perhaps it's because I'm the mother of teens and preteens, and I affiliate myself with good lefty liberals. But I would want to argue that they are are more groups organizing. In the in and out this morning, we saw people being chained for, uh, for fracking. Uh, we see the Occupy Wall Street movement that spread to countries through, uh, excuse me, cities throughout the country. Um, th those are two examples. There are many more. I guess I would want to say, when I look at the world, I see lots of people organizing in a way that you you suggested they may not be. And what I see is the Occupy Wall Street movement dead in the water. Um, and I guess I'd want, to, I, I guess I'd ask you to comment because I'd like to think Good. people power can. Good, I'm ready. But I, but I don't, <laughs> but I honestly, I, I'm not all, all that depressed necessarily, but I just don't see it happening. Okay. Well, let me comment on Occupy Wall Street because I comment on it in the book. I don't see Occupy Wall Street as a movement. I see it as a protest. And I distinguish between the two uh, in this way. Occupy Wall Street voiced a mass discontent with the inequality of income and inequality of power in this country. And they were very successful in implanting a notion in the public dialogue and in our political system, the 99% and 1%. You don't have to explain that to anybody today. So they succeeded. But they were not a movement in the sense that they didn't have clearly defined goals. They did not have a clearly defined leadership. They did not have a vision. So we didn't know where they were going, and we didn't know the steps on the way. Now, you had no doubt in your mind when Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King and others were leading, Ralph Abernathy and many others, were leading the Civil Rights Movement. They wanted to drink from those water fountains. They wanted to ride those buses. They wanted to eat at those lunch counters. They wanted to stay in those hotels, and they wanted blacks in Birmingham, Alabama, which I spent a lot of time covering, to have the same rights to get jobs as store clerks in the department stores of Birmingham. When the people were protesting in the environment, they wanted to stop the pollution from the water and of the air. And they could point at very specific things they wanted to change. Occupy Wall Street did not do that. In fact, many people from the media went and talked to them and tried to get them to do that. And what they were saying was, we're kind of a pure democracy and we would like to purify the whole economic and political system. And, and you asked them who the leaders were, and they kind of pointed at each other in sequence. And in Denver, they even named a, a monkey in the Denver Zoo to be their leader, so they had no leader. So that's not a movement, okay? I think it's very important to understand that. 
So you're right, it didn't go anywhere. It did go somewhere, it, it affected our dialogue, but it didn't affect change. Now let's look at the other side. The Tea Party, whether you like it or not, is an effective movement. They are organized, they have leadership, they want to cut government, they want to cut taxes, and they're extremely well funded. Those are components that make a movement. The Tea Party today probably represents about 9 or 10 percent of American public opinion. But as treated in the media, it sounds like they represent 55 percent. That tells you what 9 percent can do. You don't even have to organize the 55 percent. So um, my response would be to a mother of teenagers, you are in a fantastic position to have an impact. Number one, not necessarily saying your kids have got to get out there and demonstrate right away, but the civics that you teach them about the past in America so they can begin to include the idea that they might want to participate as young adults when they're making their own decisions. Because that's part of America's tradition. That's a great thing that you can do. And there are all kinds of things you can do with your neighbors. There are, there, there are any number of issues around here. I just mentioned gerrymandering. It's a huge problem in North Carolina. A bunch of people in North Carolina, I've learned this from Rob in the last couple of days, people could get together and say, we need to end this system. That is a fundamental reform that would change so many other things in the policy making and the political climate in North Carolina, it would have profound impact for years to come. In California, it, it, there was a lawsuit filed somewhere back in the 80s that challenged the legality, the constitutionality of the gerrymandering that was done by the California legislature and governor. And I can't even remember which party it was or whatever. Either party, they could have screwed it up. And it went to the courts. And the court itself named a commission, and they did the redistricting and for that decade, for the next 10 years, California had far more competitive legislative races than it had had in the previous two decades. So the potential is there. And I'm not saying that's the only issue. There are just lots of issues out there aching to be grabbed. Thanks. I love the question because it's a very important one. We're going to make this our final question here in front. You all have to arm wrestle to see which one of you gets to ask the last one. They can do a duet. Point it towards you. It's on. Just it's on. Just okay. point it towards you. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, I wish you would be back on Washington Week in Review. Secondly, um, my husband is a Democratic member of Congress, and I think he and a number of his colleagues would agree with virtually everything you said. And I think that the Democrats have been quite willing to compromise, but the Republicans have not. I don't think the parties are equally guilty of failure to compromise? Um, I, I would agree with that. I, I don't think there's any question that if we look over the history of the last 30 years, uh, that the Republican Party has changed more and moved more to an extreme than the Democratic Party, though there, there certainly are Democrats who are extreme too. I, the, the Republican Party of, of uh, Ronald Reagan is to the right of the Republican Party of Dwight Eisenhower and Richard Nixon, and the Republican Party of Newt Gingrich and 94, 95 was to the right of Ronald Reagan, and the, the Republican Party, the Tea Party, is to the right of Gingrich. I think if, if Reagan came back to life politically, he'd be at the left end of the Republican Party today. So I don't think there's any question. I was trying not to make a partisan comment or a partisan argument here. I mean, I think basically, in answer to that question asked over there, I think that, that as a people, uh, we ought to reject anybody who says, I'm not going to compromise, as a principle because it simply is going to destroy the effectiveness of our, of our government. And, and we have to recognize that. And there, there are people who are up on their soapboxes today saying, well, I'm going to defend this principle to the death and I'm never going to compromise. And defend this principle is fine. I'm not going to compromise is not fine. And I, I think we have to, we just have to understand that compromise is built into the structure of our government. It was designed that way. So it's destructive. And I think then we have to begin to argue turning our back on people who are destructive of our government uh, and, and be willing to do it on, in either party so at least we have a principle to stand on. But I sort of agree with your political analysis. Valerie, is, is it, Valerie has promised me a very short final, final, final question. Short question. Um, listening to campaign rhetoric on both sides, I'm a Democrat, but anyway, both sides, and even your talk today, I don't hear the term working class. What happened to the working class? Are we all middle class? No, we're not all middle class. But if you ask Americans if they're all middle class, 
practically everybody from 30,000 a year to 250 or 300,000 a year will call themselves middle class. No. Um, working class is often used as a sort of euphemism for lower class, and most people don't want to call themselves lower class. I'm ta when I'm talking about, about middle class people making $50,000 a year, and by the way, that is the median household income in America, if you don't know it. 50% of the people in America are making $50,000 a year or less. 40% no. 30% of the people in America are making $30,000 a year or less as household income with two earners. 30% of the people in America, that's 90 million people are living in families that are making less than $30,000 a year. It is stunning. Um, so when I'm talking about the middle class, I'm including lots of people that would have been called by some people, uh, working class people. I'm talking about what, what programs they need, what's, uh, what, what losses they've taken. Um, and certainly, uh, if, you're, if your suggestion in your question and implied criticism is to suggest that I really haven't focused on poverty and below, that's a fair question. I haven't. I've really tried to use the middle class as a touchstone because if the middle class is in as bad shape as I've described, then obviously people who are below middle class, the bottom quintile, the bottom 30% of Americans are in much worse shape. And that doesn't mean that I'm not concerned. And if you look at my 10 points, I mentioned them as well. But I was just trying to find something that's going to reach a maximum audience and with an impact that might actually cause people to rethink and do something, which I hope this has. Thank you. Thanks, John.